it's great to be here. Uh, we're really excited to have a quick chat, really, on 21st of May about Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And it's myself, Atif Chowdhury, having a, really a conversation with my fellow CEO uh, and a person who has values and, and approaches to things I very much admire, um, Cameron Malik from Disability Rights UK. Hi, Atif. Good to be here with you. Yeah, thanks, Cameron. So I guess, yeah, we just wanted to really keep this light touch and have a chat about mm. Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, what does it mean to you? What does it mean? I mean, it's kind of a big question, isn't it? Accessibility, so I'm a wheelchair user. Um, so it's something that I've been acutely aware of all my life, really, about how my accessibility to everything has been... Um, restricted in some way or not on the same level as others. I've got two brothers um, who are who didn't experience the barriers that I do. Um, and interestingly, you know, I've experienced multiple barriers because being Asian and being disabled, um, you get those multiple barriers that intersect. Um, so you kind of experience lots of different. And I guess what I've always wanted and why I headed off in my career that I'm in was that for the next generation of disabled people whichever walk of life they're from whatever culture they're from whatever part of the world they're from that they they have you know an experience of the world where there are no barriers that hold them back um, where inclusion and inclusive inclusive access is just the same as everybody else almost to the point where you don't need to think about inclusive societies we just have society just by its definition becomes inclusive where yeah. all the prejudices are kind of understood and move people's attitudes and the way we build our world the way we build our society down to the policies and things that we create mm -hmm. are all designed with a diverse range of people in mind mm -hmm. um, but fundamentally all of that whether it's technology or whether it's legislation or policy um is built by that kind of diversity of people, of thought, of background, of culture. Um, and so I guess your question was, what's global accessibility? To me, it's, it's raising awareness that we've got a long way to go, um, that we need to work on these issues together uh, and kind of try and start thinking about what would a world like that look like where we do have true accessibility for all. It's a long way to go. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I'm really glad that you, you brought up the issues of culture and um, and I guess the sort of cultural identities of where we both come from. Um, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm aware that we're both CEOs of disabled-led organisations doing yeah. very good work, um, both coming indigenously from different countries in the global south, where 80% of the most disabled experiences are there, really. And we don't often get to hear about those experiences and the stories that win and the equality demands that are so needed for all of us. And, and yeah, it's a global day, you know? Um, and I wonder, I, I still so think, you know, being from Bangladesh, I wonder how many folks in Bangladesh are talking about global accessibility, you know, on the day, on this day, you know, on this day. Do you, do you think they are? I'd like to think so, but I think you've touched on it, that there's so much inequality in the world that our role, that it just as if not the two of us, is to be pioneering to make sure that these kind of conversations can happen more. Certainly we're in an age and a time where we've never been more connected. Um, the fact that you and I can work and even in the spirit and the difficulties that we're facing in the world right now under COVID, we're able to communicate to each other through this accessibility, through the kind of demands that we've all needed. Yeah. Yeah. Right? People, um, I think we people take for, often take it for granted though, that these things, because they're online, they're easy for everyone to get to. Mm. they're not the majority of the world is still not online um and the majority of the world still has a lot to be able to say look we need equality we need accessibility and we need that to be as fairly given to us through technology inclusion as it is to everybody else yeah we, i mean we often talk about kind of the digital divide in the uk mm. you know disabled people's access to digital um tech and whether it's hardware software the internet the web all of that stuff but I'm just thinking about around the world, there are you know certainly large parts of the world where it's just you know the gap is massively different, um, much bigger 
where there are millions of people with just absolute no access whatsoever. And I, I'm so I'm from Pakistan. That's where I was born. Um, and I know for a fact that the internet and the web and access to tools like, um, you know, laptops and computers and assistive t- software, mm. it's not even on their radar. Yeah, they, yeah absolutely. They, yeah. they don't even know it exists. You know. Yeah, no, no. I have some really, you know, fond memories of being in a, in a village in Bangladesh and seeing queues of people watching, I'm showing my age here, but Dallas. <laughs> but right. yeah. would not be able to see the screen, but just whispering what was being seen, you know? Yeah. It's also, you sort of, whilst I sort of chuckle about that, I also remember, well, for that same village, it was a lifeline to see what was happening in the news. Mm-hmm. Same, the same village that was, had been impacted by war. Um, and so it, it's, it's communities and it's about connection and how we make that more accessible. The, doing days like this, the, you know, for the day on global, global awareness, it, it, it is just that, it's a campaign to say, look, there's some really great stories here. Um, yeah. but how do we make them a lot more seamless? Mm. Uh, I think even in the UK, we're in a digital by default world, but I'm also seeing, I'm doing a lot of work like now, DNA is doing a lot of work trying to support homeless people to be able to access technology so they can have a sense of voice, autonomy. And access to information that keeps them safe um but without access to those personal devices and devices that will read to them it's a challenge yeah yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. absolutely and you, you know your question is around kind of what's kind of digital inclusion mm. so one of the pieces of what we're doing is around encouraging the next generation of disabled people to be the entrepreneurs to mm-hmm. be the innovators build an ecosystem with around them through universities and other tech hub companies and Disability Rights UK and others to create that kind of environment where disabled people work alongside non-disabled people, um, building kind of the next generation of solutions um, that are not just for disabled people or non-disabled people, they're for everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, But with that kind of idea that we talked about earlier on, about that kind of just the diversity of kind of coming in, the barriers that people experience, how they're different mm-hmm. and how tech can solve some of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you've really got the fundamental point is you've got to have disabled people at the kind of at the heart of building yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, but I mean, when we think about an inclusive world that we're both, I guess, seeking and hopefully building some foundations within, we kind of will get to a point where we're really talking about tools, aren't we? Um, whether they're technology or not doesn't matter so much. It's more so much is, are these tools helpful? How do we bend them? How do we make sure that they are people-led solutions that are using these tools rather than just tech solutions? Um, and when we start thinking about those tools, you know, it could be something as, I don't know, the remote control was designed not necessarily for everyone to use on their TVs. It was designed for disabled people to use on their TVs. Um, and you think back about something that pioneering. Well, if it's good for sometimes the most marginalised person in the room, perhaps it's good for everybody in the room. And and how do we make sure such tools are just available? I'm excited about what we can do in the future ahead of us, and how we can mobilise more people to have a voice and connections. Mm-hmm. But it, but likewise, yeah, it's about keeping those lived experiences right at the heart of kind of policy to make yeah. sure it's meaningful and yeah, yeah. affordable. Uh, it's interesting when I was um, talking to some people yesterday and we were just talking about assistive technology actually and uh, the cost of it and someone in the room said you know what when you when I speak to pe- disabled people who use technology the one bit of tool they use mm. that they don't even think of as assistive technology is their smartphone yeah yeah, um, so, yeah. it has voice recognition it can yeah. speak to you yeah. uh, it can you know engage with you in different ways by vibration to feedback yeah. uh, and yet we don't call that assistive tech it's just yeah, 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 and that's yeah. kind of where it should be at that's where we should be heading towards absolutely perfect good example i mean to a point where we'll get to a, hopefully a point where we don't even think of it as assistive technology we, there's, no, there's no such thing if, if google mm-hmm. if i'm lost and google gets me home it's not my special technology and my special google map it's just there on my phone as everybody else that's right that's right yeah yeah. Uh, well, we're going to see that more and more. I mean, I'm seeing my own children normalise talking to their, talking to their uh, tablets in order to get work done. Um, yeah. And that was a time when they'd have to have a, a statement for something, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and so, I'm grateful that we're watching more multi multimodality approaches to inclusion, you know, and technology. 
um, I guess I'll feel a lot more confident when we can see them commercially just a lot more accessible to people. Um, particularly people that are going through marginalization, be it long-term disablement, be it disability pay gaps or unemployment, long-term unemployment. Mm. In that, on that sort of vein, do you feel there is some good hope in seeing technology becoming more accessible uh, for people that financially don't easily afford it? Yes, yeah, so, so I think uh, obviously, I think there is, there is certainly, it feels like we're at a moment in time where some of the big players in the marketplace, so, you know, I'm talking about Microsoft, Google, um, Amazon, Facebook, all those sorts of people seem to have a more of a proactive approach at the moment around how, how they can improve the lives of millions of people. Yeah. And when they talk about improving lives of people, they, they're not talking about carving us out into segments. Mm -hmm. They're just talking about how can tech help people live their lives. Um, and, you know, disabled people are part of that. And you see companies like Microsoft having, you know, heads of, uh, of kind of their disability side of their business um, talking in that much more kind of collaborative approach. Yeah. and how they're building the these kind of accessibility features into their mainstream products that they're just there and they will benefit millions of people yeah um, and many people will use it even if they didn't have the specific barrier but actually it's an easier way of doing something yeah dead uh, right absolutely and so then, it's so encouraging isn't it yeah so there's that kind of side happening and you've got things like you know amazon building alexa that was driven by a desire for them to get more people shopping with them, yeah. but has gone off on this tangent of, um, you know, I've got a friend of mine who, uh, when they installed Alexa in their home, mm -hmm. they could control the lights and draw the curtains and change TV channels. Something that that person, my friend, relied on someone else doing that for them. Yeah. And suddenly they were in control of their environment, yeah. Uh, yeah. which most people just take for granted. Um, so there's that side. I think. I know you always talk to me about open source software. Um, so kind of leveling that imbalance around the economic side of tech um, and kind of that side getting better and better as well. Mm. I mean, it feels like tech, kind of the hardware has got faster and powerful enough and small enough um, that, we're, that we're certainly making huge strides. Um, I've always been a bit of a techie geek ever since I was young, it was, yeah. it was actually, I think it was down to being a disabled person and not having the outdoor world accessible to me. Well, I think I they remember you talking tech. about using Amigas, which was... Uh, yes, yes, I've still got some. <laughs> We're both showing our <laughs> I've still got those, yeah, and that kind of, you know, I learned from there that yeah. I loved tech, and it's only as I got older that I thought it's not just a, a tool that you use to play or write a document, it's... Mm -hmm far more than that today yeah yeah absolutely no well i mean it's very difficult to you know we're living in a world where this is so, just so helpful the challenge is making sure that it is so, so affordable um no it's great i i, I tell you i think it's, it's a wonderful reflection on the journeys that we've been on really i think the best assistive technology i've always seen yeah it, it's well it's it definitely my phone yeah it speaks to me i speak to it <laughs> we get along fine um yeah. but, but i actually say it's my glasses you know and you sort of think people stop to think about that and that's a good example of how technology can be so profound mm. when you no longer have to stop and look at it and think oh what's he got on his face and how is how does she cope with life if she's wearing those when you just normalized it to such a point you never even have to talk about it you know? yeah yeah i suppose glasses must have been talked about as assistive tech at some point yeah. absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. great yeah i fully agree well look um Kevin, this has been wonderful talking about that. And really, for, for me, um, I guess Global, uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, it is an intersectional day. It's a day that isn't just about technology, it's about inclusion and about mm -hmm. reaching out to the very people that don't get to be part of those inclusion narratives. Um, I feel really privileged, really, to be able to talk in the spirit of everything that's happening globally that's a little bit frightening, but be able yeah. to talk to you online and talk about the goodness of technology and the way that we're actually using it right now. Absolutely. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? We, we kind of almost, for many of us, we take it for granted that this is here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. It's only the other day I noticed when I was working, you know, my broadband yeah. went down. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Suddenly you realise how reliant you've become, become <laughs> on. Yes, it is. Well, it's, 
it's um it's one of maslow's hierarchies of needs now <laughs> but, yeah. but perhaps I mean, perhaps it's true i mean it's how we communicate and we, we and we need to be able to reach people at a, at a certain pace at the moment Great. Yeah. Well, look, I've got really high hopes. I think there's some wonderful tips and I think it's a really good day. I like to, I look forward to watching this day as Global Accessibility Awareness Day gets bigger. Um, and it has more, you know, the kind of the meaning behind it is strengthened by reaching out to, as I said, the very people we were talking about in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Good to talk to you. Yeah, and you. Thank you, Karen. Yeah.